Welcome to Data Skeptic. Data Skeptic brings you discussions about how data is changing our world. Our interviews are conversations with thought leaders in topics like data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. All right, Linda, our topic for today is reinforcement learning. Let's participate in some reinforcement learning by playing a little game. Now, what makes this reinforcement learning is I'm not going to tell you the rules of the game. I'm just going to tell you how many points you earn, and you have to figure out how to earn the most points, okay? Now, the game is played this way. Every round, you say a name of anybody you'd like, living, dead, fictional, non-fictional. Uh, you say a name, and I tell you how many points you get. So let's go. Lincoln. Zero points. Kyle. Zero points. Rosa Parks. One point. Hillary Clinton. One point. Okay, seems like you get a point for women. Okay, keep going. You want me to keep <laughs> naming names? Well, are you sure that that's true? What do you want to do next? Well, I don't know. It's sure. I'm just asking. Well, how would you test your theory? We could keep going for a hundred times. I know. Yeah, that's right. But like, what will your strategy be? I would just then name men and women and start mixing it up. Okay, let's keep going. Julie. A little more specific, please. You need specific people? Well, there's a lot of Julies. I want to make sure I'm clear about who we're talking about. Uh, Julia Roberts. Ten points. Ten points. Maybe she's like a movie star? That is a hypothesis. How can you test that hypothesis? Well, I'm trying to think of another movie star name, but you know I'm bad with movie stars. All right, well, what have we seen <laughs> We recently? live in L.A., but uh, I'll just go ahead and say uh, Reese Witherspoon, who we have seen in real life. Ten points. Okay, that's another movie star. Let's, mm -hmm. Let me name someone who's less famous. Well, okay, so can we take a little diversion and let me point something out to you? You came up with a theory that, I guess, movie stars earn you how much? Ten points. You know, that, that is a hypothesis. It's consistent with the available observations you have in playing the game. However, to test your hypothesis, you went and asked another movie star. So you have confirmatory evidence, but that doesn't mean you actually know how you got the ten points. Maybe it's like, women with blue eyes or something like that. The other way you can test this is to search for contrary things and see if you get the same result. You can test both your theory and you can try and falsify your theory. Yes, that's a common technique I use in everyday day life. All right, cool. So let's like, keep going. Linda Tran. Uh, 10 points. Could be dark hair, but Reese Witherspoon's a blonde. Uh -huh. Let's go back to men. Bill Clinton. Zero points. Donald Trump. Zero points. Okay, let me name a movie star. Keanu Reeves. Zero points. <laughs> okay, let's go back to women. Let me name. Kamala Harris. One point. So politicians, so far all the pol women politicians I've named have gotten one point. Mm -hmm. Let me name another woman who's not a movie star or a politician. I believe you've named f only Democratic female politicians, right? Barbara Bush. So not a politician, but one point. <laughs> I know she's not, but I don't know if Republicans have women. <laughs> Condoleezza Rice. Was she a Republican? Absolutely. Okay. And I'm sure there are many more. I just don't have <laughs> <laughs> You just can only name her. That I know of. Yeah. That was from at least 10 years ago. Condi. Ali Wong. Uh, 10 points. <laughs> I see you writing something. Yeah, I have to keep track of something. <laughs> but you shouldn't see that. <laughs> I saw <laughs> some of it. All right, well, maybe you saw some of it. What would you... <laughs> so you cheated, basically. That's... No, you showed me. <laughs> no, you cheated. <laughs> you showed me. Now that you've cheated, tell me your expectation. What, what do you think the rules of the game are? <laughs> Cheating means I tried to cheat. You just showed me. <laughs> I'm not dumb. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I didn't realize I need to put up some screen divider when uh, we're playing this game here. I'll hold my paperwork a little bit more discreetly yeah, you here. Should. It's like, okay. It's like you have a deck of cards. Uh, listeners, let me just tell you what he did. It's as if you had a deck of cards and he put it in front of my face and said, cheater. <laughs> That's, That's not, not what happened. No, but he was writing something down, and instead of covering it, I glanced at it from, we were only sitting well, what did three you see? feet away. We're only sitting three feet away, I, to be clear. So I glance at something he's writing in front of him, three feet away, and then he calls me a cheater. <laughs> well, all right, take the information as you will. What do you think the rules of the game are? Well, you're writing male and female. You were keeping track of that. Yeah, you did discover that this has something to do with male and female, right? You observed yes. that... Every time so far you named a male, you got zero points. 
Every time oh, sometimes you sometimes one, I thought. Nope. Oh, I wasn't keeping track. Every time you named a female, you got either one or ten points. Right, right. I was. I'm still trying to determine. Oh, Kelly Wurstler. Who's that? She's an interior decorator, famous. Ten points. Uh, seems like the more famous they are, but then I feel like I named some politicians and they only got one point. So just tell me the answer. Well, there are a couple of rules. You observed one rule, and that's that if you name a female, you get one point. If you name a male, you get zero points in this game. If you name three females in a row, you get an additional nine points each time. So that would be how you got to the ten. And there was an additional rule that if you alternate between men and women five times in a row, on, off, on, off, then you would get a thousand points. Oh, and you so didn't, didn't discover that we rule. didn't get there. No, you never, you didn't uncover that. I didn't think the rules were going to be that complicated based on numbers. Otherwise, I would have written it down. Oh. Well. Anyways, uh, but mm-hmm. what th- was my strategy? Was just to name people. And then as listeners may or may not have heard, I na- tried to name people very famous, less famous, and middle famous, plus people we na- we knew personally to see if that had any impact on the score. Yep. And then I also tried to name a few men to see counter like also men that were maybe very famous maybe less famous maybe people that we knew i named kyle yep did you actually i'm not sure if i came up i said kyle and you said zero all right but you didn't ask for the last name so i thought that was interesting oh well yeah i am the kyle as everyone knows Mm -hmm. (laughs) that's why when i got to julie you said what's the last name i'm like "Mm." oh sorry i missed that yeah inconsistent (laughs) the activity you engaged in is very much like reinforcement learning So you didn't know the rules. All you were getting was a reward signal. So I was telling you how many points you get, and you already knew that, you know, more points is better. But you didn't know how to earn points. So you had to explore a little bit, try different things. And as you were able to find hypotheses about how the system works, then you could exploit them, right? You could come up with what we call a policy. If you knew all the rules of this game, then the optimal policy would be to exploit that third scenario where alternating men and women gets you a thousand points. Because if you keep doing that, you maximize your points. However, that's also a very hard rule to discover, right? Given the information you did discover, the smartest thing for you would be to always name women. Because as soon as you hit the third one, that other rule kicks in and you're getting 10 points every time. So that's how you can maximize your reward. In the past two mini episodes, those topics were the agent model of artificial intelligence, where we talked about how an agent has an internal state. They get observations from the environment, and they can take actions to change the environment. And the environment changes by some prescribed transition function, right? You know, like a a board game. There are rules that say how it goes from one configuration to the next. And those rules could involve dice, so they're probabilistic, or as we call it, stochastic. You know, that's not set in stone. The game can evolve sort of in this interesting statistical way, but by a statistically deterministic process, if that makes sense. What does that mean? It means that even though there's chance involved, the mechanism of the chance is prescribed. Roll the dice, and whatever the number is, move ahead that many spaces. And we don't know exactly where you're going to end up, but we do have a posterior distribution. We have a belief that there's a one-six probability you'll be in each of the six steps ahead of you. Mm -hmm. Even though I don't know where you're going to go next, I can have a belief about where you might end up next. So in this uh, name a person game I made up, do you think it has a state, the way a, a board game, all of where the pieces are, define the state of the game? Yeah, the state is, well, if you're counting how many names, how many names, or whether it's male or female. That's right. We have to keep track of the recent history in order to score it correctly. So the state would be like how many females in a row you named, for example. So the state's like the memory on a computer. Now, what are the actions you have available? For me? Mm-hmm. I can name a male, I can name a female, and then I could determine the order. Let's talk about the transition function. What do you think the transition function of this game was? How does it evolve? Well, you get closer to getting more points or further from that. You're thinking more of how do you play the game. I'm talking more in like how do you score the game. So I had to keep track of if you've been saying female names and how many, right? Because if it's three or more, I gave you more points. So I had to maintain the state of the game, which involved counting how many you know recent female names you used. So the state has a variable called like the streak of female names that can be 0, 1, 2, or 3. 
And actually, it could be more than three, but I don't care after that, right? Once you have set the third, you're still just getting 10 points. So this game has four states then in that respect. That's the, the state, and the transition function is just to increment that counter by one if you happen to say a female name. And lastly, the reward function is, as we've been describing, one point for a female name where you're not on a streak, 10 points if you've hit the streak. Okay, so, so what is that called again? That is the formal description of the game in sort of the agent framework of how to specify it. While we're on the subject of reinforcement learning, I want to tell you about Brilliant.org. Brilliant can help reinforce your learning, pun intended. They offer some excellent courses that complement our show's topics especially well. You've heard me talk about their Artificial Neural Networks course before. I'm currently working my way through their computer memory one at the moment. As you know, we love doing Data Skeptic. I hope everyone learns a lot listening to the show, but the next step after listening is doing. So after Data Skeptic, head over to Brilliant. They can help you master concepts by solving fun, challenging problems yourself, and not just by hearing people talk about it. Brilliant is an excellent learning platform with a lot of fun problems and great instructional components. Let them know we sent you by heading to brilliant.org slash data skeptic. Now more complicated games like chess, they obviously have a lot longer description, but it fits the same thing. States, actions, transition function, and reward function. Now what makes reinforcement learning interesting is I don't give you some of those things. You have to learn them on your own. So you have to figure out the game as you go, and you do that with this feedback loop of the reward signal. We have previously done an episode on the curse of dimensionality. Do you remember that at all? It's been a couple years. No, tell me. So imagine you're playing chess, okay? You can look at the current state of the game, what the board is like, you know, and examine your position, and you need to pick your next move. The best move you can pick should be not just what moves you a little bit closer to winning right now, but hopefully leads you down the road to winning the whole game in the future you have a couple of options you can pick from, right? Different pieces you can move different places. So what you need to do is say, hmm, what if I move my pawn in this certain way? Well, that changes the board, right? If you do that, then next turn, your opponent gets to move. So you might play what's called a mini-max game. The mini-max is like minimization maximization. So how do I maximize my reward and minimize my opponent's reward? Let's assume my opponent does the smartest move they can think of, and then it comes back to me, and I get to pick my next move. And then to them, they again get to think of the smartest move they can play, and so on and so forth. If I consider even a single move, it turns into this really big tree of exploration, right? It's a decision tree. Yes, it is. It's a massive decision tree that you can never hope to solve exactly, because it would take far too long to calculate it. Mm. So this is where thinking too much about what your move slash someone else's move takes too much energy. Yeah. That's why you people just decide sometimes. Well, uh, so this is not a psychology podcast, but that would be a wonderful topic for such a podcast, yes. There are interesting things to be thought about as to why people don't always behave rationally and a lot of reasons for why they don't. But machines, at least so far, pretty much perform rationally because we create them that way. So the curse of dimensionality stops us from solving non-trivial problems, basically. You can solve like tic-tac-toe with brute force. It's a small enough game you can do it. You can't solve chess because of the curse of dimensionality. So you've got to find some way of making this easier. So there's some pieces of reinforcement learning that I haven't laid out for you yet. I've mentioned the policy. The policy is just the mapping from what you observe to what you should do. So think of the policy as like a really good coach, right? And you're playing some game and the coach says, all right, next round, what I want you to do is go in there and take this action. And you don't even have to be good at the game if the coach just tells you what to do, right? You just follow their actions and you will achieve presumably uh, as well as you can within the ability for them to teach you, right? Or to give you instructions. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Can you say that again? I'm confused. Let's imagine you were going to play chess. Are, are you very good at chess? I don't know. I haven't played in many years. I'm going to count that as not good. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I could be a you were on chess a team, yes. genius. You well, don't know. You are not a grandmaster. Let's agree about that. But if you played a chess game and you had Gary Kasparov as your coach and every round he was just going to tell you what move to take, you could do pretty well, right? Maybe. If you just turn to him and say, Gary, what should I do? And he tells you your action. That's like a policy function. It maps from the current state of the game to your best possible action. That's your policy. Yeah. 
Now, in reinforcement learning, one of the things we want to do is learn the best possible policy. One policy could be in chess, move a random piece and hope for the best. Another policy could be, you know, like calculate some heuristic that tells you the smartest move and do that move, which I imagine would be a more winning strategy than picking a random action, right? However, both of those are policies. You want to find the optimal policy, the one that's going to lead you to the most wins. Mm -hmm. Now, we can't find the best one because of the curse of dimensionality. So sometimes we can find clever ways to find a good policy. And there's lots of techniques for that. Another thing you can try and learn is the value function. The value function tells you the exact value of doing a particular action in a particular state. In the name a person game that I invented, the value function would say that if the streak counter, actually, no matter what the streak counter is, just say a female name. That's the optimal policy in my game. Right. But if we think of something more complicated, like, I don't know, SimCity, then different actions have different values at different times. So, like, if your city's on fire, then the best action is to send out the, you know, firefighters to go put the fire out. If there is no fire, then you don't want to waste time sending firefighters out, you know? Mm -hmm. So there's both policy learning, which is kind of like directly figure out the best strategy. There's value function learning, where if you can figure out the value function, you can calculate a good policy. And there's also model-based learning that we're not going to get into today, but I thought I should mention it for anyone who wants to do some extra credit after the show. Now, there's one more piece I want to mention. It's a technique that... It's kind of falling out of fashion. It's very useful, but there's some more advanced things that have come out. But for the sake of completeness, let's talk about feature-based learning. And this is a a canonical example of this, is how they taught reinforcement learning to play Pac-Man, the game. You remember Pac-Man, of course, right? Oh, yes. Describe it just in case young people don't know about it. There are these circles with mouths, and then there's dots on the screen. Mm Mm-hmm. The goal is to eat all the dots, but then there are these blobs that run after you and try and kill you. Mm -hmm. So you have to eat the circles while not being eaten by a blob. Ghost. I don't know what they are. (laughs) Well, I assure you they're ghosts. They have a wavy curtain edge on them. Yes, that's that's right. (laughs) So I thought they were blobs. But wouldn't a blob be more amorphous and less exact? Hey, these are like in the 80s. In any event, (laughs) if you tried to solve this the deep learning way, you would consider the state of the current game as like the pixel values of the whole screen, which is super complicated and you need some massive computational power to solve it. But there's an easier way people solved it before that. And it's to come up with some features so you can look at the game and a feature might be how far away is the nearest ghost from you? Or a feature might be how many pellets are close by? Or how close are you to one of those power-ups that helps Pac-Man eat the ghosts? So these are all like simple values you could observe of, of a particular state of the game. And best of all, if you were to calculate those values and specify them, you could turn the problem into a simpler problem where you have, instead of all of the pixel values that describe the whole game, you just have a couple of these features, you know, how close is the nearest ghost? Yeah, well, sort of like metrics. And then you can ask a reinforcement learning to figure out how to win the game. So you could present it all these examples that don't really describe the whole image of the game. So the reinforcement learning system might not even know exactly where Pac-Man is. It just knows like, oh, if there are a bunch of ghosts nearby, you need to run towards the Mm power-up. Something like that. You can fight the curse of dimensionality there by reducing the state space. So you're actually solving a slightly different problem. You simplified it. Yeah. There are times when maybe Pac-Man would make dumb decisions because it's too simplified. But if you can do a very nice simplification, it's it's a good chance that then you have a more practical ability to do some reinforcement learning. So this is called feature-based reinforcement learning. Just as has been the trend in other areas of machine learning, uh, like computer vision, we can replace this feature-based approach with a deep learning-based approach. In the past, we've talked about image recognition, where when deep learning approaches were applied, we did an episode a while ago, a mini episode called Automated Feature Engineering. And this is a property people say deep learning networks have in that As you add multiple hidden layers in the middle, what happens is the algorithms learn to create their own features. And then they learn based on those features how to solve the problem. And the same thing can happen here. 
Whereas it might have been smart to solve Pac-Man by saying, oh, one feature is how near is the closest ghost or how many ghosts are in a certain radius of you. The deep learning approach, deep reinforcement learning says, let's just give you all the inputs and let the network automate that feature engineering process and come up with these intermediary representations that help it solve the game. Now, you might not be able to interpret those intermediary representations the same way you can't tell me exactly how you know a photo is of your sister. You know, you can't tell me in terms of like, well, it has this pixel is this color. You don't define her in terms of pixels. But somehow you have all these intermediary representations where you can recognize parts of her face, her eye position, all that kind of stuff. And through those, you're able to recognize her so quickly. So unless you already know something really hard about your problem, I would be inclined to start with feature-based reinforcement learning approaches where you handcraft some features, not because you're going to solve the problem that way necessarily. Maybe you will. Maybe you'll be very clever. But you should at least see some positive growth there. You should come up with an okay, decent agent if you spend a lot of time making those features, which should be an indicator to you that you will get value out of trying deep reinforcement learning. Because if a human can come up with some good features, then almost certainly a network can as well. But if you jump directly to deep reinforcement learning without knowing what you're doing, you might just waste a lot of time. So what have you learned about reinforcement learning today? Sounds like it relates to the policy. Yes. And then I good forgot answer. what else. The value function. And the value. Yeah. That's all I learned. That's good. Those are like the key bullets. If you walk away understanding what policies are and what value functions are, you are well on your way to understanding reinforcement learning. Now, I left out some things like the exploration versus exploitation aspects of this and you know the multi-armed bandit problem that we've covered previously. It's a big topic, and we're going to cover it in some future mini-episodes. But basically, when you have a problem where there are some major unknowns, particularly the reward function, but there is a feedback loop, then you need reinforcement learning to help try and learn something about that scenario. So it's different and distinct from a lot of the machine learning we talk about on the show. A very common use case we talk about is where you do supervised learning, right? Something like fraud detection. You can label all the transactions and which ones were fraud and which ones weren't and algorithmically find ways of predicting future risk on unlabeled data. Here, there are no labels whatsoever. You just have to figure out an optimal behavior based on this loose feedback loop, which, by the way, could also have a delay. I didn't talk about that. What if in the person naming game, you did get 10 points for naming uh, three females in a row, but the 10 points only kicked in like five rounds later? That would be really tricky, right? Yeah, well, I didn't figure out the rules anyway, so in my head it was already tricky. Well, thanks as always for joining me, Linda. Thank you, Kyle. And we'll see you again in two weeks. Data Skeptic is a listener-supported program. To support the show, visit dataskeptic.com and click on the membership tab.